was a film that promised new revelations. Who killed the president? The implications were frightening. If they could kill the president, what can they do? On the set, a sense of mission. I think Oliver's after big fish with this movie. A grueling schedule would take its toll. Now, let's just shoot the old way. Some in the press thought the film was blasphemous. An outraged director fought back. On Backstory, JFK. Assassins need payrolls, schedules, times, orders. This was a military-style ambush from start to finish. This was a coup d'etat with Lyndon Johnson waiting in the wings. From the moment the word got out that Oliver Stone was set to direct a film about the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the project was mired in controversy. The picture said that a U.S. president, President Kennedy, was assassinated by people at the highest levels of the U.S. government, which is, pretty, which is a very shocking thing to say. The official story of the assassination is published in the Warren Commission report, which states that a lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald, killed John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Those Warren Commission fellas were picking that shit out of pepper. Nobody's going to tell me that kid did the shooting job he did from that damn bookstore. A younger Oliver Stone didn't question the lone gunman theory. But as Oliver Stone, director, began to tackle subjects of social significance, his view of the events in Dallas began to shift. Then, in 1987, publishers Ellen Ray and Bill Shapp handed him a copy of On the Trail of the Assassins by former New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison. They met him in an elevator, and Ellen Ray handed him Garrison's book and said, you should read this. Oliver is one of the few people in Hollywood who actually is a voracious reader, and he read it. On the Trail of the Assassins is a first-person account of Garrison's investigation into the murder of John F. Kennedy. I thought this was an interesting thriller, and uh, a sort of a whodunit with a why done it. He called up Alan and Bill and said, I want to do this, but I'm busy. I have, I have to go make Born on the Fourth of July. I don't have time, but I'm worried somebody else is going to get it. Who can I get to start working on this script? So they suggested me. I had been working with Garrison for two years. I, had, uh, I knew the material backwards and forwards at that point. I'd never written a screenplay. And he said, I don't care how long it is. He said, don't read any of those books on how to write screenplays. He said, write from the heart. So that's what I did. This is too big for you. You know that? This is too... Who did the president? Who killed Ken? Man, it's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery wrapped in a riddle inside an enigma. The shooters don't even know. Don't you get it? Stone knew his decision to tell the JFK story from Garrison's point of view would be controversial. Despite claims that the conspiracy was engineered by the CIA, in the end, Garrison was able to indict only one person, Clay Shaw. In the ensuing trial, the well-respected New Orleans businessman was exonerated. Severely criticized in the press, Garrison lost his job as district attorney. But for Oliver Stone, Garrison's story represented a quest for truth against all odds. It was a way to get into this very universal story that everybody knew about, but we could follow one character who was going to investigate it, and through that character, we would follow him and as he uncovered different pieces of evidence that led him to this conclusion that the CIA was involved. Stone wanted experienced actors that could handle complex roles, and to get the budget he wanted from the studio, he also needed star power. Keep your eyes on the camera. At this point in his career, even with successes like Platoon, Wall Street, and Born on the Fourth of July to his credit, Stone still had an uphill fight. JFK was to be an expensive film. Stone now took the idea to the head of Warner Brothers, Terry Semmel. Semmel, eager for a meeting, had wanted to pitch Stone on a biopic of Howard Hughes. However, as Stone laid out the threads of the JFK story, all talk of Howard Hughes was put aside. But for a $40 million budget, Stone had to deliver a big star. The film was not actually financed until 
less than a month before we actually went into production, and that only happened because Kevin Costner came aboard. Listen to this. Oh. <laughs> You guys are worse than you guys are worse than the CIA. They're everywhere. These guys wear plants on their shoulders, so they could just. Well, it started with a, a phone call. Really, um, I was making Robin Hood in London, and Oliver was beginning to prep this movie, uh, and he wanted to talk about it. I generally don't talk about movies while I'm making another one. But the idea of Oliver Stone tackling an issue that seemed very still vague and unsolved by most people's standards was interesting. With all the elements in place, Stone now faced a daunting task, filming a script which contained 212 speaking parts, 118 scenes, and more than 1,000 camera setups. But just as the film started to roll, the critics began lining up to take their shots. Next on Backstory, Oliver Stone finds himself not just directing a movie, but fighting a war of words. Nearly three decades after the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Oliver Stone had secured the backing to film his version of the events. Central to the story was the president's last ride through the streets of Dallas. For director Oliver Stone, Dealey Plaza would have to look exactly as it did on November 22, 1963. Oliver had asked that we do our best to achieve the reality of 1963, completely detailed, so that he had the freedom to shoot anything and let it intercut with the existing footage of the time, the historical footage. The only visual record of the assassination was taken by a bystander, Abraham Zapruder, on his home movie camera. The original material was shot in 8mm, so we shot a certain percentage of our material in that format, as well as 16mm because a great deal of follow-up material was shot by Newsman, which was black and white 16. So we had attempted to incorporate that same format to uh, allow us to match material shot in 63 with material shot today. Secret Service? There should be an agent up here. No one has ever restaged this assassination the way we are doing now. Now, the assistant directors had a map of the plaza. We had pinpointed everyone, the girl in the red dress, the man with the umbrella. Every person had a mark. Deborah had, you know, a, an elaborate book of reference, and we had this map. Dealey Plaza, which was a huge undertaking. There was so much with um, old cars and stalling cars and those kinds of things that would go wrong. You'd have to explode the president's head all the time. You know, you didn't want the car to stall. And the motorcade's coming blocks and blocks and blocks and blocks and everything, this, that, this. The head explodes, the car stalls, you know? And then you have to take everything back to one. It takes hours, clean up the actor, you know, that kind of thing. So, and this would go on day in, day out. Did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. They have taken the actors were asked to do their own research on the characters they were about to play. I'm just a patsy. Gary Oldman played the alleged lone gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald. He said to me, go and find out who he is. And they gave me, you know, a bunch of plane tickets and some per diem, and I met all these kind of strange people. And you become less an actor and more a sort of investigator. I picked Gary because he's just a superb mimic. You can look at Oswald footage and he'll come back with Oswald's accent and he'll nail it. I positively know nothing about this situation here. And I do uh, request uh, someone to come forward to give me uh, a legal assistance. Action. Walk out. Okay, FBI. Recreating the autopsy of John F. Kennedy was crucial to the telling of the story. It was a difficult challenge, since no records were available, and much of what happened in that operating room was subject to speculation. I can feel the end of the wound with my finger. That won't be necessary. That, that's a little low. There's no reference that we could have, you know, you know filmed or photographic reference, and the scene had to be 
create, it had to be imagined how it, how it would work. The three Bethesda Naval Hospital doctors picked by the military left something to be desired, and so much as none of them had any experience with combat gunfire wounds. And to have to deal with the cadaver of John Kennedy was uh, both depressing and delicate. The mood the day of the autopsy seemed was very quiet, somber kind of. It was almost like they were performing an operation. It really was in that day in that room. Okay, let's check the back, gentlemen. All right. There's a considerable amount of spinal fluid coming in right here. Okay. I can feel it at the end of the wound with my finger. That won't be necessary, Commander. Watch the ear, watch the ear. Yes, sir. Shot in the back. Can't cry. He said, who's in charge here? I am. Pat. OK, moments, Print. Okay, a few things went wrong. Bubsy, wait for my cue at the beginning. The brain, uh, Gordon? Yeah. I have a little problem with it. It seems very neat to me. Prepackaged. Is, is it a prepackaged item? Is it like. While Stone was immersed in the problems of production, critics began to create problems of another sort. Claiming the film would do a disservice to history, some went to great lengths to smear the project. Washington Post reporter George Lardner Jr. had gotten hold of an early draft of the JFK script and used it as grist for a highly critical article. The publication of the piece, shortly after the start of principal photography, was to have a profound effect on the director. That really changed the atmosphere on the set. I mean, Oliver was very troubled by that for good reason, because he'd been holding close to him the information that he wanted to be a surprise and not to have it discussed in the press prior to the exhibition of the film. That was very, very, very disturbing news for him. We had to maintain secrecy. The script was heavily guarded. Every crew member had to sign for it. He knew that he was playing with fire, that there were people that they would like to prevent that film from being made. Oliver made a decision that he would respond to every single attack. And Oliver, during production, would be out there shooting from five, five in the morning. He'd be finish at 10 at night. He'd go be writing letters to, to the editor. Despite the criticism, or perhaps as a result of it, the cast and crew rallied around the director. The mood on the set remained one of passionate enthusiasm. That's his first mark. Just do the wrap up. Okay. They all felt they were involved in something incredibly important, politically and socially important for our country, and they knew this. First, middle, and last, Clay Laverne Shaw. Address, 1313 Dauphine Street, New Orleans. It was a very important movie, I, I, I think, because after it came out, less people believed the conventional wisdom of those events than did before. The conventional wisdom was not wisdom, it was foolishness. Well, I'll volunteer, because I'm a good soldier. I know you are. <laughs> Aaron Volk. <laughs> I got to get that cleaned up, though, first, right? Yeah. Well, fingerprint. Fingerprint. That's true, yes. Fingerprint. Okay. I think that the people who have chosen to make the movie to put in the long hours are doing it a lot because they believe in Oliver. What I'm saying here is that if, if I allow him to go He just on. commands a lot of loyalty. I, that's what I like. Because I can't afford to put him on a stand unless we have an agreement. The making of JFK was an enormous undertaking with a seemingly never-ending production schedule. Come on, guys, we ain't gonna make it. We go. As days turned into weeks and weeks into months, the stress began to take its toll. And roll, please. It's rolling. Last take on this series. Action. Action. Oh, just the length of it is concerns me. It's 67 days now. We have uh, 79 days. I've never shot a picture over 65 days. They're framed. Uh, we put the horses in. Well, we can back that up. No, no. Let's just shoot the old way. God damn it. I'm concerned about the length of the film. It's going to be four hours right now. You, 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 got, to, you got to be in the gutter to smell the gutter. Ha! I love the gutter. It's just a big story because it's got the threads of the Kennedy story, the Garrison story, the uh, Oswald story, and uh, 
another character in Washington, D.C. called X. So I have four stories that are kind of bouncing off each other, and we're trying to thread them through. I think they work on paper, and I think it will work in the film, but length is an issue. Okay, cut. Cut! On the 72nd day of production, Stone called it a wrap, but his struggle had only begun. Next on Backstory, amid a continuing barrage of criticism, Stone heads for the editing room, where he faces an almost impossible... With principal photography completed, Oliver Stone faced a daunting task, weaving together a virtual mountain of film footage. He can push. He was also up against a deadline. We have the tightest schedule I've ever had in a movie. We're trying to make a Christmas of this year, although all the odds say that it won't be possible. Mathematically, we're going to have about 600,000 feet of film. The picture is going to be close to four hours long, and we're going to try to put it in some kind of order, three-hour order. The fourth take, uh, I, I held off the pushing. Four editors worked around the clock, taking direction from a fatigued and often temperamental taskmaster. Pietro cuts a, a scene, and it's the first, the first pass on it, and we sit there, and it just lays there. He feels pretty bad, and then I get, you know, being a Virgo, I can come down on him sometimes pretty tough. But uh, we try to also give out praise when, when it's due. I don't remember that, that <laughs> point. When, when did that happen? Uh, it's happening more and more, if you know. You lied to me, you hypocrite! Liar, you son of a bitch! Oliver Stone had more than just his Christmas deadline to worry about. He knew that his fight with the press was by no means over. Critics would charge that Stone had distorted history by seamlessly blending documentary and dramatic footage real and imagined events, and creating composite characters based on several different individuals. It's a dramatic, it's a dramatist's uh, piece of work. I'm shaping history for, to a degree. I'm making composite characters, I'm taking composite events. I'm trying, and I believe I'm staying true to the spirit of the uh, inquiry. But don't forget the issue of the film. Why was Kennedy killed? I submit to you that what took place on November 22nd, 1963, was a coup d'etat. Its most direct and tragic result was the reversal of President Kennedy's commitment to withdraw from Vietnam. The war is the biggest business in America worth $80 billion a year. President Kennedy was murdered by a conspiracy that was planned in advance at the highest levels of our government. And was Scenes like these raised serious issues among journalists. In a 1991 article, New York Times correspondent Bernard Weinraub focused on the studio's responsibility in backing the controversial project. It raised issues of um, a corporation's responsibility for the product that they produce. Um, uh, and of course, at that time, uh, Time Warner said, oh, of course, they didn't believe in that, any of that stuff, but um, a director can say what he wants to say, and we support a director. But then the issue becomes, um, what happens if a f famous director or well-known director makes a movie that says um, Hitler was right, or Bin Laden was right, or something like that? You know, what does a corporation, what does a corporation do then? I don't think either Warner Brothers or Oliver Stone could have expected that this film would be taken as seriously as, as absolute literal history as it has been by some people. I think if they were not prepared for the moral implications of releasing a film like that, it's because they didn't expect that people would sit there and just accept these, these hypothetical things as the truth. Warner Brothers stood behind the film, claiming that Stone was exercising his creative freedom other directors were also vocal in Stone's defense. It's funny, in this country we tend to think of ourselves as Americans and no such thing could happen the way things happen in uh, Renaissance Italy, for example. Machiavellian plots, you know, but why not? I believe it. The same people probably killed Malcolm X or Martin Luther King and Fred Hampton and uh, Che Guevara and we go on and on and on and on and on. The truth is the most important value we have because if the truth does not endure, if the government murders truth, if, it, if we cannot respect the hearts of these people, then this is not the country in which I was born in, and it's certainly not the country that I want to die in. I think the film does touch some truth, and uh, I, 
I think that that is what, you know, we hit a nerve. We hit a nerve, and I think it tells you a lot. JFK was finally released in December 1991. It was slow to gather steam, but eventually grossed over $200 million worldwide. It also garnered eight Academy Award nominations, winning two for editing and cinematography. In the wake of the release of JFK and the public debate surrounding its production, Congress passed a law in 1992 which allowed access to the formerly sealed files surrounding the assassination investigation. For better or for worse, the film was to change the way many thought about the tragic circumstances of JFK's death. People often say to me, what about these poor school children that you've influenced to see this as a conspiracy? They don't know the truth. If this film raised questions for them that they then had to discuss with their parents or with their friends, that they then had to go out and do further research and come to their own conclusions, that's all to the good. JFK also changed the way the world viewed Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone will always be known for JFK and it will always be cited as one of his major films and in Oliver Stone's obituary. It would be mentioned first, I think, because it was so controversial. 